think we should just get started because the first part's more of an introduction. And so if people do join us late, that's okay. Um, for those of you, I'm gonna turn my camera off once we say hello. But first off, my name is Christina Baxter and I own a company called Emergency Response Tips. Many of you know me or have been to a lot of my uh, talks in the past, but one of my favorite instruments on the market today, and it's been on the market for years now, is the AP4C by Pro Engine. And as we go through today, I think it will drive home to you why this is an instrument that I consider a frontline piece of kit and not something that a lot of people have relegated as a chemical warfare agent detector. But reality is, while it's a phenomenal chemical warfare agent detector, uh, if I'm going to wait for chemical warfare agents, I'm hopefully going to be waiting my entire lifetime and never see them uh, in the real world. So it's outside of a laboratory, obviously. But using it for toxic industrial chemicals is where I've gotten most of my use from the AP4C. So we wanted to talk about that a little bit today. I want to introduce to you, for those who haven't met him before, uh, Dr. Scott Hartley, who works is the CEO of ProEngine USA. And so, Scott, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. I think one of the objectives of what we're trying to do, so I've been in this role for about two and a half years now, and one of the things I realized was we didn't do a really good job of educating people uh, in regards to what our instruments can do or what they can't do. I think sometimes uh, detector companies are really great at telling you what they can do and very poor at telling you what they can't. I think it's important uh, to have both that information because we want people to use the instrument wisely and when they're supposed to. And we also just uh, feel that there's a need in the industry to just to continue to educate and train people on the art of the possible, what's out there, and just you know educate people on new, uh, new ways of doing things that they've done in the past. Um, so that's kind of what the purpose of a lot of these webinars are, is just to increase the knowledge in the, in the field. Okay, I'm going to take our cameras off. Um, now, for all of you who are just hoping to hear only about the AP4C, I'm sorry, but that's not the way we do things. So, because we need multiple different technologies to deal with any type of uh, threat, we're going to be talking about several different things. But we are focus focusing on that first do-in type of response today. Okay, so camera is going to go off, and then I'm going to start in with the presentation. So you'll see, similar to what we've done in the past, that we do an approach where we have um, gone with, I'm going to start out with kind of a background to the problem, and then Scott will talk about how AP4C works, and then I'll talk about how that then works into an operational response and bringing in a bunch of other pieces of kit. So first off, I wanted to um, kind of bring your attention to where all of this information is, because I do get, I actually just got three different emails this morning of, can I get access to this presentation afterwards? Two were for people that were heading out on calls, and another, I don't know, um, but reality is yes, we are recording these presentations, and uh, you can get access to them from ProEngine. So ProEngine has a YouTube site, and they will send you the link after this to where that will be stored. Obviously, it takes a couple of hours for us to render the video and cut out all that front stuff of just Scott and I sitting there twiddling our thumbs waiting for the time to arrive. Uh, but reality is ProEngine has been working on a new website. And if you go to the ProEngine.com website, it's kind of um, got a lot of new information out there on how does the systems, all the systems they sell work. But it also has what's called the ProEngine Academy. Uh, that's still under development, but something that's coming soon. But that's going to be the one-stop shop for us on training materials, application notes, technical notes, and then all the past webinars. So you'll have access to all that information. So I just want that bring to your attention because we do talk about these application notes that go with each of these webinars. And while you have been getting them via email from ProEngine, the goal is over the next uh, quarter that these things will be hanging on the website and you'll be able to get there, um, register in and get access to all the materials in one place. So that's just kind of letting you know where we're going and some housekeeping on, yes, I talk really fast, especially for all of you who English may not be your first language, I'm so sorry, but we are recording it. And so you can go back and 
as you know, Scott and I put our emails and phone numbers on these. If you have questions, feel free to reach out and ask anytime. So let's start off um, just with the very basics. Now, I think everybody has seen this over and over again. What are the states of matter and how does that relate to how we do detection? So reality is most of us talk about detection in terms of gas detection. But we have to remember that when we're starting to talk about materials that come out and surround us, it's not just the gases, but it's those vapors coming off of liquids, and it's also the aerosols. When we get into aerosol detection today, and if you've listened to some of our past webinars or webinars I've done in different areas, aerosols is the emerging threat of where we're going. And reality is, in terms of detection of aerosols at low levels, we're really gonna be relegated to the AP4C in today's world. If we wanna get into identification of those, as we all know, the AP4C does not identify, it tells us information about the chemical, but not specifically what it is. Then the MX908 is your way to go on those types of things. But reality is that state of matter dictates where we're gonna find our sample. So is that sample just gonna be sitting here? Is it coming out to meet me? Information of that matter. Now, the reason I brought up aerosols is I wanted you to think about this one, and this is just fentanyl itself, and we hear about fentanyl being an issue, um, and most people think of it as an issue as a vapor, but it's really not. What's happening here, and if you look at the AP4C nitrogen channel here, you'll actually see that as that droplet goes down, the fentanyl aerosolizes on its own, and part of that is to do to the electrostatic properties. So now they've been droplets, and we're gonna watch two second time time, and now we have our fentanyl hitting the sensor. So it's the electrostatic interactions within the aerosol that's causing that. If you wanna see vaporization, this is vaporization. Now we're gonna heat it up above its boiling point, and now you're seeing vapors. Obviously, all of this was done safely in a vented fume hood, uh, so there was no uh, chance of us getting exposed here, but you can see repeatedly that that fentanyl is hitting directly on that uh, sensor. And this is really important because most of us, uh, when we look at our sensors that we use for our first in, we have a lot of filters on them. And those filters are gonna be blocking us from getting our aerosols. And that's because a lot of instruments can't handle an aerosol load. But in this case, we can. So let's go on to vapor pressure because vapor pressure is really where it's gonna be at for a lot of these things. When we look up products vapor pressures, those are generally listed at 20 degrees Celsius. So when they take it, it's in a laboratory environment, very pristine, and it's what is the vapor pressure of this material. Now, all of our gases have vapor pressures higher than 760 millimeters of mercury. It's all around us, it's easy. We can get up to a million parts per million of that material out there. Now, when we get into our liquids, that's where it gets really interesting because even liquids down here in that close to zero millimeters of mercury, we see the um, ability of these materials to still produce small amounts of vapor. And based upon the sensitivity of the detector you're using, you may be able to detect that. And we're gonna focus in on that a little bit more, but remember, Temperature plays a huge role here. So if we're looking at the vapor pressure of a liquid and it's outdoors and it's 80 degrees, um, obviously Fahrenheit, then we know that the vapor pressure is gonna be higher than what we're reading off of a chart. So understanding vapor pressure of how much gas is gonna come off of the threat material. The other one I just wanna remind people, and these are all things that I see time and time again in detection is vapor density. A vast majority of the materials that we work with are going to sink in air, meaning you're going to find them in the low-lying areas. You aren't going to find them above the container. So when you go in into a downrange incident and you want to start measuring, unless it's a gas, then you're not going to get it up above things. If it's something that is, you know, if it's lighter than air, so hydrogen, helium, ammonia, those types of things, they are gonna go up. But the things that we're dealing with most of the time are actually coming down to those low-lying areas. So please keep that in your mind when you go to detect things, holding your sensor straight in front of you or up in the air, 
is really only covering a very small percentage of chemicals. Holding your sensor down towards the ground or in low-lying areas is going to cover the vast majority of chemicals. So when you start to play in your entries, remember in your head that this is a critical component of how we find a chemical. Now, we also have to remember that temperature plays a role here as well. Because remember, things like anhydrous ammonia are generally in a container that's under high pressure. And we're putting it into a liquid form and it's getting very cold. So when that first releases, that gas, even though its density is less than that of air, meaning it should rise, it's going to stay close to the ground for a period of time before it goes up because it has to warm up. And then once it warms up, then it goes up higher than air. So please keep these things in mind. But just to show you a little bit about sampling, this is just doing hydrogen sulfide. You'll hear Scott talking about this. Um, let's see if it's moving. For this example, we created a relatively weak reaction, but we are still able to demonstrate some of the important aspects of detection. First of all, the gas is colorless. So if the source was hidden, our eyes wouldn't be able to detect it. The vapor you are seeing is a reaction with the raw materials and the humidity in the air. For the AP4C detector, it will detect hydrogen sulfide in the sulfur channel, which is designated as S on the meter. Hydrogen sulfide gas is heavier than air, so this must be considered when detecting it. As you can see in the video, as the detector is moved above the sample, the gas concentration is reduced. But that as it's brought closer to the sample, the detected concentration increases. This is an important consideration to take into effect when you're trying to detect it. If you're holding your detector very high up in the air and the source is down low, you may not be able to detect it. And this can be seen directly from it. So this is just showing you, this is a very low level. So most detectors won't be able to see it because of the high sensitivity of the AP4C, it's detecting it. But reality is we had to break the surface tension even a little bit to get it to go up. And the thing, when you're working in a fume hood, you actually have some ventilation pulling up. So that was helping us a little bit too. But reality is when we're starting to talk about hydrogen sulfide building up in this space, it's going to build up to the top of this Petri dish and then it's going to roll over the sides. It's not going to just come up and about. It'll roll down the sides and you'll be better off detecting it adjacent to versus over the sample. For this example, we okay, so let's look at this one on response time because this is also very important. Understanding the response time to your instruments. If we have something like the AP4C uh, has a response time around two seconds, we have a PID, a photonization detector, has a response time around uh, three seconds. But if we go up to something like a hydrogen sulfide chemical uh, selective electrode, now we're talking about something that's response time at 35 seconds. So really big difference here. In this case, we're also using a five gas meter to be able to detect it. As you can see, again, we're demonstrating the fact of the fact the, that the material is heavier than air. So as you're detecting above it, you can't really see it. But when you put it directly into the source, since it's heavier than gas, it'll come out of the beaker and want to go down towards the ground uh, to the surface of it to be able to do that. Now, we are operating here in a vent hood. So because of the vent hood, you will have some uh, gas that tends to go upward more so than it would be in a normal uh, type of environment where there's no uplift of air in the, uh, in the device. Ms. Okay, so we did bring up response time. And I put this together, it's just an animation, to kind of show you what you should be thinking as you're going down range and you have all these different pieces of kit with you. What are the times in which you should be taking that reading? Because this is one of the critical things that I see time and time again that's a problem. Okay, so these are being measured in real time here. So we had two seconds to AP4C. The PID um, was about three seconds along with the JCAD and survey mode. Indicating papers are about three seconds to 10 seconds, depending upon which paper. Your JCAD or LCD3 in standard mode is at five seconds. Your LEL and your oxygen sensors are at 15 seconds. <coughs> now we have to wait a little bit. Okay, so we've got a couple of seconds to wait, and then we're going to see our first electrochemical cells, our CO and our chlorine coming up at 30 seconds. 
and then a couple seconds later we have our hydrogen sulfide. Now we have to wait a full 15 seconds more. Actually, I think it's 25 seconds more till we see ammonia. Okay, so ammonia is our next one. And we won't wait all the way for the hydrogen cyanide because that just takes too long. But we'll wait for ammonia. And so we're still trying to get that first reading of the, of the ammonia's reading. So all that time it took to get our first ammonia on electrochemical cell. If we're talking 60 seconds here, our hydrogen cyanide sensor is out at 200 seconds. So when you have all of these electrochemical cells, try to keep in mind that they have a very long time before you get a readable response. Now, with that said, I was actually working with one of our, um, some of our colleagues recently out of the 92nd CST um, civil support team in the US out of Nevada, and they were using theirs and saying, what they do is they go based upon the response time of the LEL and the oxygen, so that 15 seconds, and then for their electrochemicals, they just look and see, is there any movement? If there is movement, then they wait and wait that time out. If there isn't any movement, then they assume that it's not there um, or it's not there at high levels because you would start to see that tickle of the sensor early, even though you wouldn't get that 90 percentile, which is a readable measurement um, until the time period. So this is really important in terms of how long you wait to read your measurement. So when you start thinking of that from a different perspective, if you're walking in your hazmat suit, walking at you know the standard slow rate of 20 minute miles, okay? If you're measuring with your AP4C and you're not waiting that two seconds, you're five feet away from where it actually took the sound. With your PID and your JCAD or LCD3, you're at seven and a half feet. For your LEL meter, you're at 37 and a half feet. Feet. So if you're talking about going into an area where you're supposed to be monitoring for explosivity and you are now almost 40 feet into the area before you get your first measurement, that can be quite problematic. And when you get to your electrochemical cells, the earliest ones are going to be around uh, 75 feet in. So we have to remember time is really important here. And when we go in, sometimes it's best to set that sensor there and let it sit for a period of time and give you information. Now, I'm gonna pass it over to Scott for a moment and have Scott walk you through how the AP4C works, and then we'll go into operationalizing that information. So Scott, I'm gonna be bring this yep. one. Okay, it should be up now. So what is flame spectroscopy? So it is sometimes referred to as flame photometric detection or FPD is a lot of times how people refer to it. It can also be referred to as atomic emission spectroscopy or flame pho photometry. There's a lot of different names out of there. I prefer to just use flame spectroscopy. It uses the principle and it's found in a lot of chemical labs. So if you go to a university, most likely you'll see some version of a, a FPD detector that's there. Now, most of the, the, the systems were about a, about the size of a large table. They are definitely not handheld, um, but they are used on a daily basis uh, because the process is a very repeatable and um, known process to be able to do there. So on the bottom right, you just see some of the different colors that are produced when different materials go through the flame. Uh, if you can click on the next slide. So how does the, the process exactly work? So what we, what we do is it's a known phenomenon where you apply energy to materials and what happens is when that energy is applied to the materials, they become excited into an excited state. And then when they relax, they actually release light in the case of this is photons of energy. And each of these materials has a unique uh, light associated with them. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that looks like in a little bit, but it's it's a way to look at it is it's a fingerprint associated with each of these known, each of these materials. So what it does is it allows you to identify the specific material that you're looking for. Um, fireworks work on the same principle, just the opposite. So in the case of that, what they're using is known materials because they want to get a certain color out of it. And, and they're actually using an explosion in order to create the energy to create the excited phase. Um, the energy source can be anything from electricity to a flame to an explosion. 
Um, in this case, what we use is hydrogen. Uh, the reason for using hydrogen is it's one on the periodic table. So you can get a lot of, uh, you don't need much, much weight or material in order to run for extended periods of time uh, with it. The other advantage of hydrogen, it's a very um, pure burning and a very um, hot flame. So, it, but it's not too hot. So there is a, you can go too hot and actually um, bake some of the material and not the process not work available. So you have to have a sweet spot as far as the, the energy source that you're applying into the system to be able to do that. Next slide, please. So how do we detect these different elements? So first of all, we go through the process and we introduce the heat. And then um, what we're doing is the detector is looking for those specific fingerprints or those certain materials. And then when we reach above the threshold that we're looking for, it starts to indicate with there. So how it's working is we have uh, a series of processors inside that are collecting the spectral information, analyzing it, looking for those specific fingerprints associated with each of the materials of interest that we're um, interested in trying to detect. And then we output that. The way to look at this is it, it's kind of, um, we're doing real-time spectroscopy. So we're doing this multiple times a second and we can get an output of every two seconds. The way I like to look at it is we're doing truncated spectroscopy. So because we aren't collecting information over thousands of nanometers of, of um, collected information and then comparing it against known spectra in order to give you an output, we're doing it real time by focusing in on the visible spectrum of these materials and what they produce. So we get the accuracy of spectroscopy um, where we have an advantage is that we're doing it much faster than spectroscopy normally will work, or even other methods where you're collecting spectra or um, you're collecting you know, information over large um, areas of um, collected information like FTIR or Raman uh, to be able to, to use that and compare it against known databases to make matches associated with the materials you're dealing with. An additional uh, benefit of the technology, so when we release light, we can actually collect the information on how much light is being produced and therefore we can use that to identify concentration levels. So if there's atoms there, we see it. Um, when they're at higher levels of concentration, there's more energy that's producing more light. So therefore we can quantify that. So it's both a qualitative and a quantitative method. So first allows us to look for that specific fingerprint. And then the amount of energy associated with that specific material allows the system or how the systems work allows them to collect that information and then quantify to larger amounts of um, information with there. So um, more material, more light, more concentration, less material, less light, lower concentration is the process of how it works. So it's a very repeatable um, process. And so we aren't subject to false positives or false negatives. What we can't do is identify the specific material. So we're looking for core materials and I'll explain to you why that's important in the next slide. So how the system works, um, what we do is we have a small fan into the, into the detector, so we're pulling air through the device, and then we introduce hydrogen. And so the hydrogen comes through and we, we um, turn on a flame. And so that flame is in, an is in a burner, so it's intrinsically safe. So it's just isolated from the outside environment, so you can even be operating in a hydrocarbon environment and not have to worry about exploding it or anything like that. Um, so the flame, the materials come through there, and then if they are the materials of interest, what happens is that light is produced, and then we're collecting the light and then analyzing that. So we get the benefit of using solid state electronics and the fact that they can collect this information and analyze it many times a second. And, and we're then using that information in order to make distinguish. So we're looking for specific materials of interest um, that we're trying to um, identify and see. Now, the, the process as a whole can identify on the words of over 40 elements. In this case, we're really focused in on, you know, five major channels of information. If we're doing um, biological detection, we'll add additional three channels of um, other materials that we're looking for, but the process itself um, is able to do multiple items simultaneously. So we're just sitting there looking for those materials to come through. The way I like to describe it is if the atoms are there and they're at a high enough concentration, then we will trigger and we will see them. Um, and so it's a, it's a very known and repeatable process in that regards. Next slide. So as far as the output on um, the device, uh, what we're doing is we're looking for five channels of information. So phosphorus, hydrogen, nitrogen bonds, um, 
hydrocarbons. So we're letting you know that you are involved in a high hydrocarbon environment, uh, arsenic and sulfur. So those four channels, and I'll talk to you about this on the next slide, is what exactly they're correlated. The reason why we chose those materials were there. What we're doing is we set the minimal, each channel has a unique um, trigger associated with it. And that trigger was set based upon chemical warfare agents, which tend, which are always um, the more harmful materials that we tend to see, the ones that can affect the human body the most um, and, and the quickest at the lowest concentration. And then what we do is we get as much range that we can outside of that system. So uh, you can actually have too much light. So uh, the way that I like to describe it is if, uh, if you're, uh, you're outside and you have a big spotlight on you um, in the middle of the night, um, and you're pretty much blinded, you can see the light, but if someone held a flashlight next to it, um, you wouldn't be able to see that flashlight because your eyes are inundated with um, light and they can't see any more light. The same process is with it. There eventually becomes too much light that we can't identify um, additional atoms that are there or additional intensity of light that's present. In that case, what we do is we start to blink, just letting you know we're reaching an over, um, overmatched, uh, not overmatched, but an over level thing. So we can't identify additional amounts. When it comes back into range, it'll just go back into that that um, process. So you don't have to worry about like blowing up your instrument or anything like that. Um, you're able to, to be able to do that. Uh, next slide, please. So what we're looking for really are these four core materials. And these materials were chosen, uh, you know, our, our pedigree was originally in um, chemical warfare agents, and then we've morphed into both chemical and first responder type applications in the fact that a lot of these same materials, a lot of your chemical warfare agents, so you take in the left-hand side your, your organophosphates, which are your nerve agents, um, these are just modified versions of pesticides and insecticides that are designed to work better against the human body, right? They're engineered to work better against humans than insects. Or And so, um, the same principles apply for those, and those can be harmful for us as humans if we aren't paying attention, so um, or harmful for the environment um, to be able to do that. So those same principles apply. So in the case of the phosphorus, we're looking for organophosphate-based materials um, for those. So those are your nerve agents continuing over. You have hydrogen-nitrogen bonds. We say hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen because technically. Um, uh, hydrogen nitrogen does not like to exist by itself in free air so to be a good chemist you have to say HNO but you but for a detection standpoint you do not have to have the oxygen present to be able to do that in all practical purposes because we are using the night the hydrogen up in the flame uh, we're really just looking for the nitrogen bond but we're looking for that these hydrogen nitrogen bonds they're in a number of different types of materials so your hydrogen cyanide your nitrogen mustard uh, ammonium a lot of your opioids, all of your opioids and a lot of your pharmaceutical based agents also have hydrogen nitrogen bonds in them. And so they are detectable in the detector as um, Christine showed you the fentanyl and um, any versions of opioids, they all have the HN um, in them. And so they are detectable with the system. Continue on arsenic. So arsenic is found in arsenine or lewisite. Um, there are some vomiting agents that have it in there, blood agents and some blister agents. Um, and of the channels, whenever I say, you know, if you see arsenic, that's the one you need to be worried about um, the quickest because usually anything that has arsenic on it is not good for you to be around. Um, there can always be things on those other channels that may not be bad, but uh, in general, world, arsenic is pretty much always bad. And then uh, the sulfur channel, so that is your mustard gas. There's a number of um, binary agents, your hydrogen sulfides to be able to do that. Um, so they're primarily your blister agents, but they are found in a lot of acids and uh, a lot of other um, toxic industrial materials as we'll talk a little bit further later. Next slide. So just to kind of highlight on the specifics of um, what the, the AP4C can do, um, we sample every, we're telling you the output of what went through the detector every two seconds. Um, so we're sampling multiple times a second. So we get actually a pretty good clear out of the system. So as those materials go away, um, it clears out of the system fairly quickly to be able to do there. So we're able to detect as low as two parts per billion, um, which is pretty dang good. It's my understanding out there. It's not easy to get down to those ranges. Um, so in the case of the, you know, the organophosphates in particular, your phosphorus, where you're dealing with some pretty nasty materials that are out there in the, in the form of fourth generation agents, you want to get down to those really, really low concentrations. Um, and we can do that. Um, these devices are, are ruggedized and militarized. 
So really what we've done is taken a machine that is in a chemistry lab and we made it robust and handheld. Um, so something that will fit at larger than a table, uh, we can bring down and hold in your hands. And that's kind of the science of what um, we've been able to do. Uh, we didn't invent the technology. It's been around since the days of astronomers and Galileo. Um, so we did not create it. Um, we've just uh, refined it and, and brought it into the, you know, a military type environment and a first responder environment that uh, abuses materials um, with there. Just the other thing is that we don't have any libraries. So there's no upgrades or other things like that. We're continuously looking for those materials um, to be able to do that. And we can do all those materials simultaneously. So they don't restrict it to one at a time. You can have multiple things. Um, there, there's scenarios where you can have multiple channels triggered because those materials are, are in the materials, or you could have two different materials at the same time, and we can detect those. And we do work with gas and aerosols. Um, and then if, it's, if there's off-gassing of liquid, we can see it. And then we also have devices in the case of a non-off-gassing liquid or in a solid. You can, you can heat it and introduce that into the device so we can handle all forms of matter to be able to do it as well. And that's it. I'm here talking to you guys and I'm on mute. But I'm gonna go back in and, and walk through a couple of these things. And this is where we're gonna start talking about a variety of different technologies and how they work together to provide us with answers. So in this case, just kind of a review of what Scott said. The AP4C itself in vapor mode, okay, so and I'm going to show you the differences between these. That's going to detect gases and aerosols that have phosphorus, sulfur, arsenic, and nitrogen. And for those gases, if we know the identity of the gas, um, then we can actually tell you exactly how much is there based upon the response because the instrument is uh, very specific calibration. Now, it can also detect vapors from vapor forming liquids. How do we know if a liquid will provide us with enough vapor to be able to detect? Now, keeping in mind, um, we have to have a way to have a headspace for these very low ones. So I generally will take what I'm looking at and put like a funnel over it to have it really hold in a lot of those vapors and then measure it. Um, but anything containing phosphorus, as long as the vapor pressure is greater than or equal to one and a half times 10 to the negative six millimeters of mercury. So this is what we're talking about when we said that the sensitivity of that phosphorus channel is down to two parts per billion. And this is really important when you have something like a Novichok or an A series agent, which has a really low vapor pressure, but which we have been able to see obviously in the laboratory that we can actually measure an A-series agent, even though it's an oily liquid that likes to stay where it is in vapor mode, because we can get down to those low levels and the headspace. So anything with sulfur, arsenic, and nitrogen in the vapors above these uh, pressures. And that's where it gets really important is how much material is produced based upon the vapor pressure. So the sensitivity does decrease from phosphorus to sulfur to arsenic to nitrogen. That's intentional because it allows us to have a broader spectrum of things we can measure. Now, how do you interpret that data? If you know what you're, you're working with, you can use the chemical companion or what it's really called is the emergency response decision support system. But to get access to this, if you are a civilian or military first responder in the US, Australia, or their partner countries, then you can register at www.chemicalcompanion.org and you can get access to the software. It is a downloaded software. It works resident on your iPad or your tablet or on your uh, regular PC computer. It is not optimized for your cell phone at this point in time, and it is not optimized for use on an Apple computer, but on the iPad, yes. Now, the things that it can tell you, if you know the chemical, you choose the chemical, then you say, hey, I have an AP4C, show me what the exposure standard would look like for ammonia. So you can see down below, the exposure standard is 25 parts per million. You can see that it's showing three bars on the uh, AP4C nitrogen channel. And then you also see this toxicity bar, which is showing yellow. 
What that means is you are in an area where you should probably have, well, not probably, you should have respiratory protection. That respiratory protection does not have to be an SCBA, but you could wear a canister or a cartridge as long as it's suitable for ammonia. Now let's come over to the right hand side. The other one that I like to do is say, show me what IDLH would look like, the immediately dangerous to life and health level for ammonia on an AP4C. Well, it's gonna show up as all four bars, but not flashing. All five bars, sorry. They're gonna all be red. Your bottom one's yellow, your other ones are red, and it's not gonna flash. So you're still within the realm of the instrument. And on your toxicity bar, it's gonna show red that you have to have an SCBA on. Now, the other thing you can always do is if you are just using the instrument and say, hey, I'm showing up two bars, what does that mean to me? Well, in this case, it means you're between 8 to 24 parts per million. So when you first hit that, go into the second bar, you're at around 8 parts per million. When you come out of it, you're around 24 parts per million. Now, to make this instrument easy to use in a military environment, all of the data is clustered into these bars, but the bars are calibrated so we know exactly what they mean. There are other ways we can get into in another webinar where you can get the exact concentration out of it as well, because the instrument's actually reading the exact and then assigning it to a bar level. But again, this is just ways for you to operationally interpret your data quickly and efficiently in the field. Now, a lot of people ask me, uh, how do you use it? The gas is easy. You have this inlet here on the front. It pulls in using a, a pump, pulls in all of your different uh, vapors and gases and aerosols. But what if it's a liquid or solid? So I'm going to show you, and this is um, Olivier doing this. And he's taking off, just pulling it out. You see all the numbers went crazy. Now he's putting this in. Um, this is the new interface. And I call, I call it the craft bike, but it's really the interface for your uh, S4 port PE sampler. And what you're doing is you're getting a sample. Okay, you're going across the surface, grabbing out where your sample may be, whether it's solid or a liquid, getting some onto the end of the tip there. And then you're holding it into the interface, heating up by pressing on the gun, and that will heat up your sample and you get your vaporization of the sample and then you start seeing it. Now, when you start to see something, I usually just take it away pretty quickly just to ensure that we don't uh, just keep burning off extra material into the environment. It's pulling all that material directly in to the inlet and burning it up in that hydrogen flame. So really quickly and easily, you can take that instrument, replace out the front interfaces for the vapors, instrument still on and running, pull the first one out, pop on the other interface which just looks like a little cup and that one one thing that i do see sometimes is if you don't have the cup pushed in all the way you'll see the top uh, level the top bar lit across all four channels it'll just be that top four bars and that just means that you don't have that pushed all the way in so press in on that and then you'll see that that goes away you put your inlet cover on for your sampler and then you just take your sample put it over this, squeeze, heat up the temperature, and that pulls it off. So it's really a handheld thermal desorption interface. Now, what does it tell you? So when we go in, if we weren't able to see something before, but now we know that we have a very low or no to no vapor pressure on that liquid or solid. So what we're gonna do is increase the temperature on them to about 160 degrees Celsius or 320 degrees Fahrenheit. And what that does for us is it brings that vapor pressure up from a lot of those different chemicals that we couldn't see before. So what we're now looking at is at this temperature, is there vapor pressure high enough that we're now able to see things? So we're vaporizing some, some were just increasing their vapor pressure and getting some of the material off. And it's really about making sure that we heat it to a point. Now, the SV4PE temperature of 160 was chosen specifically because things like sarin, VX, or VX, or some of the A-series agents, when you start looking at the temperatures at which we can start to see increased uh, volatility, it fits right on in through there. So you're able to see them all. Now, 
how do we take this information and put it with our other information that we have on scene? So when we're investigating a toxic industrial chemical release, the first thing we pretty much do for all releases is rule out that there's any radiation hazards, right? Um, you would be surprised the places that we find radiation hazards. Uh, just in the last year, several times in different clandestine laboratories that worked for drugs, why they had radiation, nobody knows, but they did. Then we're going to measure for flammability, make sure that we don't uh, become part of the problem, measure for oxygen concentration to make sure all of our sensors are working properly, and that if we're not on SCBA, to know that we have to switch to it because we're in an uh, oxygen deficient environment. Monitor for corrosivity. What are we seeing? Is it something that goes airborne that is allowing us to see whether it's an acid or a base? Okay. Determine where and how to measure, not for corrosivity, but for everything, for toxicity. And then that's going to tell us, is it a solid? Is it a liquid? Is it a gas? Is it vapor forming? Is it not? And then are we having to go with a vapor or a liquid and solid? And then the other question, is our photoionization detector responding? Now, I'm a firm believer of bringing a PID in on all of our calls because it does give us a lot of information. As you'll see, when we went through the list of um, high-end chemicals of threat that are either produced in high amounts, transported in high amounts, used in industry highly, all of those different materials that also have a high toxicity to make it threatening to the individual. Reality is we can use the AP4C to pull apart more of those than our PID is going to. And we'll get into why. So when I look at those different things, when I say radioactive, the information that it tells me is yes or no, is it a radioactive material? Okay, and this is important because a lot of times we're looking at these things and saying that um, what is the information it's providing and we're not thinking that through. So flammability, when we're measuring that, at the concentration that is available, is it a flammable environment, okay? that can change that it could be not flammable at one area but as you go in further it's a very flammable environment and remember these are all continuous monitoring when we do corrosivity we have to remember that we're just using something simple like ph paper but we have to use it in multiple ways so first we wet our ph paper we hold it above the liquid or in air and say is it changing is the atmosphere around us or is the vapor coming off of a liquid corrosive? Now, that tells us that we do or don't have a corrosive vapor-forming liquid or a corrosive gas. So that tells us a lot of information there. Now, when we go take that wet pH paper and drop it directly into the liquid, that tells us about that liquid itself. Is the liquid itself corrosive? When we go into dry pH paper, which I like to take in as well, so it tells us right away, if it's yes, we have a corrosive liquid that has a lot of water in it, meaning it's in a solution. If we get no detection now, but we did get it when it was wet, then we have a highly concentrated corrosive liquid. This happens a lot with something like sodium hydroxide. If you get a highly concentrated sodium hydroxide, it may not change color in the pH paper because there's not enough water to react. You have to have water on pH paper for it to work. So it's either it's not a corrosive liquid or it's a highly concentrated corrosive liquid. So using wet and dry can help us look at whether it's a solution of a corrosive liquid or a highly concentrated form of that corrosive liquid. Now, M8 paper, a lot of us don't use it, but we all have it sitting there. So the question is, what does it really tell us? Now, on a standard traditional call, is it telling us whether we have nerve agent or we have a blood agent, blister agent, those types of things? Well, probably not, let's hope, because we don't see those in our regular calls. But what it does tell us is if the material soaks into the paper, then it's an organic material. If it beads up on the paper, then it's water-based material. So we end up having a quasi-water-finding paper just by using up our old M8 paper. So it gives us some information. And then the other thing you can see is for the materials that do absorb into it, the color changes. If you keep a table of known cross sensitivities to toxic industrial chemicals, then you can start figuring out quickly what you might have on scene. 
Now, when we add in our AP4C and our PID, our electronic tools that we use for that first in, the APC, uh, AP4C in vapor mode tells us about gases, aerosols, or vapors. In the liquid or solid mode, it tells us a little bit more about the liquid or solid's boiling point and its vapor pressure. So we start adding that together. And then with our PID, it tells us yes or no on the ionization energy being less than the ionization potential of the lamp. And what does this mean here? Most of us use a PID in operations that is a 10.6 electron volt PID lamp. For us to see a chemical in there, its ionization energy must be below 10.6. So when we start looking at a chemical in a chart and we see all these ionization energies, if it's less than 10.6, we should see it just fine. And remember, this is for gases. So we're having to deal with things. Now, vapor coming off of gases, fair game as well. So let's look at a couple of different examples. So this one here, um, and now the examples I'm using, I'm just showing you that these things are hazmats that are happening every day. This happened um, just two days ago. There was a leaking package, uh, I think it's in Illinois, where a fire department hazardous fears response team was called in because the person delivering the package got the chemicals on their hand. Now, I'm going to use two example chemicals that were not part of this incident, uh, but just showing you that these things are happening as we speak. So reality is, example liquid number one. If we had gone through and said radioactivity was no, flammability was flickering at 1%, Corrosivity with wet pH paper above liquid was yes, and it was turning color for a pH 14, so a, a nice vibrant blue. Corrosivity in wet pH in the liquid also was a pH 14. And corrosivity dry pH in the liquid was also yes, pH 14. So M8 paper was yes, the material went in and it turned yellow. Then the AP4C was positive in the nitrogen channel, but it was flashing meaning it was over its level. And the PID was hitting 140 parts per million. When we look at that, we're looking at all of this and we know right away, we're not dealing with a radioactive material. We know from the pH paper, we're dealing with a corrosive liquid that is basic and it's a water-based solution because when we use dry paper, it changed color, okay? We know it's a vapor-forming liquid because when we held the pH paper wet above it, we actually were getting material and change of color. We know that the vapor itself is flammable. That tells us that the vapor pressure has to be pretty high because the concentration is pretty high. Because remember, we measure vapor uh, flammability in percents. So if we're talking about something in percents, we're talking about a minimum of a thousand parts per million for one percent. So when we start looking at that, we have to remember we're at pretty high concentrations toxicity-wise. The AP4C is telling us that it contains nitrogen, and the ionization energy is telling us it's less than 10.6 electron volts. So pretty quickly, we're able to rule out most everything else and come up with, hey, it's an ammonia solution, and that vapor concentration is probably around 1,500 parts per million. How do we determine that? We determined that by looking at the flammability here and at the PID concentration and looking at its cross uh, calibration factors. But let's look at something that's a little bit more difficult. So in this case, we're going to look at a liquid, again, that has no radioactivity, but it has a flammability showing up. It's just flickering at that 0.1%, the lowest level we can read with our uh, LEL sensors. Our corrosivity with wet pH paper above liquid is showing nothing. Our corrosivity with wet pH in the liquid is nothing. So we're at seven. Our corrosivity with dry pH in the liquid is still at seven. The M8 paper, um, no, but the liquid absorbed in. We didn't see any color change. The AP4C, we're hitting a nitrogen channel with three bars really close to the liquid. And then the PID is showing nothing. So that tells us right away that in this case, we have a liquid that's not corrosive and it's an organic based solution because it went into the M8 paper. The vapor forming, it's a flammable liquid because we got flammability coming up. Okay, vapor 
pressure has got to be pretty high to get us up to that 0.1%, right? And it contains nitrogen, but it's heavier than air. So the vapor density is greater than one. Now, our ionization energy is going to be greater than 10.6 because we're not seeing it on the PID. When we take all of those things together and look at our highest grunt materials, we could figure out pretty quickly that it could be acrylonitrile at 30 parts per million or acetone cyanohydrin with 22.5 parts per million. Now, this, you're probably thinking, well, wait a minute, where did you even come up with the list? So how did I do that? Well, first I took the list, and I for this one I used the list from uh, International NATO's International Task Force 25, and what they have is the top 98 gas phase or, or chemicals that have a gas constituent to them that are actually going to be toxic. And so what we're looking for here are going to be high hazard chemicals. So I took that 98 chemical list and said these are the ones that are most likely to be toxic. And I cut those down to just the ones that were containing nitrogen. Because when I went through that list, I found that 56% of the materials on the list, I could start to pull apart using an AP4C. I then went to ionization potential because there were 38% of the chemicals in that list that had ionization potentials that were less than the 10.6 so that I could start to detect. But I first went and said from 98, let's get it down to just those that contain nitrogen. So we're down to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 chemicals that had nitrogen that were in the list. Then we come to ionization potential and say, which one of those have an ionization potential greater than 10.6? Because we weren't seeing it on the PID. So now we can rule in that it, it could be one of these five chemicals, acetone, cyanohydrin, acrylonitro, cyanogen, hydrogen cyanide, or fuming nitric acid. Now I go to my pH paper and I said, I know I had a vapor forming liquid. So it could be acetone, cyanohydrin, acrylonitro, or nitric acid. I'm taking those gases out. And the vapors are neutral. I can rule out nitric acid. So I'm now left with acetone, cyanohydrin, and acrylonitro. If I look at what their concentration would be at 0.1%, I look at their LEL and then calculate out what 0.1% of the LEL would be, which would be 22.5 parts per million here, or acrylonitro, where I look at its LEL and say what's 0.1% of its LEL, 30 parts per million. And then I have to also take into account their vapor pressures. And what I'm doing here is saying for acetone, the vapor pressure is 0.76 millimeters of mercury for the acetone cyanohydrin. That tells me that the maximum headspace it can create is 1,000 parts per million. Acrylonitro has a vapor pressure much higher. It can actually get a maximum headspace of 143,000 parts per million. So now the only way I can come between these two materials is to create a headspace. And like I told you before, I like to do that just by putting um, a funnel over the material so that the material is kind of forced into any vapors coming up into a small column. And what I do is find out if my LEL in that tight space goes above 4.4%. And if it does, then I know it can't be acetone cyanohydrin because 4.4% would represent its 1,000 parts per million maximum headspace. So once it goes above that, then you know it's acrylonitro. If it doesn't go above 4.4%, then you don't know which one is which, and you'd have to start looking at tubes and things to pull them apart. Again, your threat may be very similar, so it's really about figuring out which one by looking at just those pieces of information we had from our first entry pieces of instrumentation so this is something that your hazmat planning person is working with saying as you're calling out what information you're getting from an instrument hey we're seeing this on the nitrogen channel we're seeing nothing on the pid we're looking at our ph paper and we know that it's a vapor forming liquid but that the vapors are neutral because we have a flammable concentration, but we're not seeing anything on the pH paper. And just start ruling things out that way.
Now, another interesting call now, and I put this one in uh, as LAFD hazmat squad, just because this happened in July for them. But the call that I'm going to talk about is actually a different call that happened last year, but the same type of thing. They were called, it was another California team, called to recycling center. And they called us because their AP4C was giving them signals on sulfur and arsenic. And they could not figure out from all the chemicals there, what could have caused this? So what we did is made a list of all the types of materials that were in that recycling facility. Okay, there was everything from keys to pots and pans to appliances. It was all this recycled material. But how many of those actually contained something that we would consider a hazardous material that would come out to potentially meet us? So we know cars, planes, trains, boats, home appliances, paint cans, electronics, and batteries were the ones that jumped out as, hey, let's look at those. So we pulled those apart and then said, which one of those would likely contain a sulfur source? So you'll see here that I have batteries and they're bolded, and that's because it's the batteries within the cars, planes, trains, and boats that was actually causing sulfur for them as well. So those batteries have sulfuric acid in many cases. And so we knew that we had a sulfur source readily available. Now, when we started looking at the arsenic sources, that became a little bit more interesting. We knew that depending upon the age of the circuit boards in cars, planes, trains, home appliances, as well as any of the electronics, that they would actually have arsenic coated circuit boards. And so electronics is highlighted here because it's electronics in each of these that we're looking for. So seeing no obvious overlap of things that would have both sulfur and arsenic, we had to look at it as a mixture of things coming towards us. So in this case, it ended up being a battery that was leaking sulfuric acid onto an old circuit board, which was then releasing arsine into the air. And that was what they were getting those levels from. The levels were very low, um, but you were still able to detect it with the AP4C. So in the end, they used the AP4C to try to find it. They used pH paper to find out which battery was leaking and they were able to isolate the systems and get the um, issues to go away. So in that case, it was just used as looking through what are the materials we have, what types of materials could they contain, which things would give us a sulfur or an arsenic, and then putting that together in an investigation and saying, it's probably leaking battery leaking onto an old circuit board. And they found that, they were able to pull it away and stop the situation. So with that, I was going to end there. Just remember, all of you will receive a follow-up email from ProEngine that will have an application note on detection and monitoring of toxic industrial chemicals. And you'll also get a link to this webinar. So if you want to go back through and, and listen again, or if you want to have others listen to it. Also note up above, we have my contact information, email and phone number, as well as Scott's. And you're more than welcome if you're on a call or if you have questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, this does not have an extra at. I don't know why I put that in there, but it's just Christina Baxter at emergeresponsetips.com. So that extra at's just there for fun. I'm going to pull up right quick. We have a couple of questions. I saw right away um, that there were a couple of questions. So I'm going to ask Scott to join me back up. And I'll put my camera back on so you guys can see that it's me. So one of the questions were, are there advantages or disadvantages of some of the other flame sources you mentioned with respect to the laboratory flame spectroscopy instruments? Um, I don't know what he means by that one. Scott, do you know offhand? I would what he say, means? you know, if you want something that's portable, so there's a difference between a laboratory and a portable machine. So the reason why we're using the hydrogen is because it makes it very easy to be portable. So, I mean, two grams of hydrogen will allow the detector to run for 12 hours. There's no way that you're gonna get a battery source that provides you an arc um, to be able to do that. And then your, your explosive option is not really something that's uh, readily, that you really wanna replicate on, a, on an easy basis. So, I mean, you could use other gases to use, to produce the, um, to, you know, the heat, the flame, 
Um, we are using hydrogen because it's one on the periodic table, so it's super light, but also has a very good consistent flame um, if you control it. So you could use other gases. Um, it just probably wouldn't work quite as well, and they would, you know, be either more costly or also, you know, um, require more weight and more transportation associated with them. So it's more related to the portableness of of the um, the material uh, and the detector, making sure that it's you know a lightweight detector is more the driver on it than anything else. At the end of the day, it's it's still it, all those options would produce the the excited state on the materials. Um, you do have to worry about you can actually burn the materials or carbonize them. Um, so there is a sweet spot. So you can't be too hot or too too cold temperature wise. So it has to be a, you know, it's kind of like the porridge has to be in a just right range in order for it to work. Okay, okay. there's another question here from uh, Sherman. So it's would you would like to clarify about the H and O channel? Does it detect volatile end compounds or specifically the H and O complex in NOx? Um, and the answer is, yeah, it <laughs> it does detect. So it's a nitrogen channel. But we have to say, to be scientifically correct, that it's HNO. So those materials that have the nitrogen uh, in there are is what we're detecting. But when you actually detect it, it's actually seen as HNO. So that's why it says HNO. But yes, it's volatile nitrogen-based compounds, which generally have the NH. And as it's burnt in the air, it takes on that oxygen as well as you break it down. Um, and then Sherman had another question is how are we measuring the flammability? In this case, we're using our LEL sensor on our foregas. So when we measure flammability of something, pretty much every call, hopefully you are bringing in your foregas monitor, which does monitor for your oxygen concentration, your lower explosivity or lower flammability limit, depending upon what you call it, where you live, and your CO, carbon monoxide, and your um, H2S, hydrogen sulfide concentration. Those things are really important for us from a confined space aspect, as well as what should we wear for protection. Uh, here's a here's a good loaded question from Keen Desmond. Uh, any update on the chlorine channel? I'll put all that at you, Scott. That's yeah, so it, um, it's something that we're working on. So um, just as far as flame spectroscopy goes, so chlorine can go through it. The problem is when it, chlorine goes into its excited state, it doesn't produce visible light that we see. So that's really the crux of the, the issue associated with it. Now, um, we are actively working on in our R&D lab. Um, so there's a couple different options on ways to detect it um, that could be added to the system. And so it is, we, we're aware that of, you know, of the materials, the chlorine would be a nice addition to have there. So it is something that we're working on is the answer to the question. And, um, it, you know, uh, we have a lot of uh, nice things since we're working, we are spending a, a lot of a lot of efforts on R&D and continuing to improve and evolve um, our detectors. And so I say next couple of years, it'd be something that we most likely will try to add. Yeah, there's a lot of things. If you look and something I hadn't <laughs> seen. So just for background, I had never seen the AP4C in my civilian job. Uh, working in the fire service and with the fire service for many years. It wasn't until I was on a trip to Israel where I actually got my hands on an AP4C and I was like, what is this? And then started playing around with it. And so that was only in 2006. So when you start looking at that, um, started playing around with the instrument then and started finding all these different nuggets going, well, wait a minute, why are you only using it for that? Because doesn't it measure these other materials? We started playing around, we're like, Oh yeah, it definitely does. So then we started playing around more and more and started, that's how we first came into contact with the folks from ProEngine because it was over actually in Sweden at the international conference. Uh, one more question, oh, actually two more questions we have. So one is sensitivity to methane. Reality is methane is a carbon-based material and therefore not something that we measure with the AP4C. I say that with a however. Because if you look at the front of the AP4C interface, you'll see that there's a CH uh, channel. And that's really telling us when we're charring or burning up something and having a uh, place where we could actually be lowering our flame constant temperature. And that because we have a lot of uh, material burning up inside. And so you would be able to measure methane that way. It's not a way I would recommend measuring for methane. 
there are methane laser detectors out there that work phenomenally well if you could afford them. Um, but in this case, Scott, do you know offhand what the sensitivity would be? Because it's pretty high. Yeah, it's about three, I think 300 to 600 parts per million of what it does. So, I mean, what you're doing is you're putting, you know, we have a flame, so you're putting more energy into the flame by having the hydrocarbons present. So we can sense that. And so that's really how we're able to do that. So we're the reason why we're telling you that is twofold. So one is don't light a match or a fire source because it could be a really bad day for everyone around you. Um, the second is you're putting more energy into the system. So therefore, some of the readings because of the light, you're producing more light because of the, the additional um, energy source that you're putting into there or the response that you get subsequent to those materials going off there. So we're, we're warning you um, from there. So we're still able to accurately identify the phosphorus is there and sulfur is there. The concentration levels could be off a little bit because of the additional materials or energy that you're putting into the system. So it's also kind of a warning um, on both both sides of it. Okay, um, we actually have a couple more questions that come in. So we'll keep going while we have questions and then we'll uh, stop that way. You guys, whoever has to jump off, we completely understand, but the questions will be captured at the end for you uh, in the review of the video. So can the exact concentration value be read from an AP4C? So the answer is yes and no. So in terms of the yes, is the AP4C getting the exact concentration value? Absolutely. The exact concentration value is then transformed into information and lights up an LED light on the display in the bucket in which it lands. Now, saying that, is the information there? Absolutely, it's there. The information can be ported out from the AP4C. Um, I don't, now you guys have a kit. I, we've, we've done it by stealing the information. So I'm going to turn this over to Scott to explain the kit that allows that to do it uh, easier than what we had to do in the beginning. But now we have a new kit and I forget what you call it though. Yeah, so so we're storing the information on the device itself. Um, so there is a there is a port that's on the detector that you can actually plug into a cable and download the data onto there. So what we're doing is a timestamp and then the information for each of the channels, and that could be brought in, you know, to a simple to an Excel file delineated by comma or something like that into the system. So you can actually see it, and it'll have each of the channels and the you know the readings as far as the parts per million and other things like that. So uh, we do have systems that um, send the information wirelessly. So in theory, you could have up to um, eight detectors put around a perimeter and they can all be sent to a laptop inside a control center. So you can monitor all those things simultaneously um, with that. And or you can also use a training tool where you're sending information. You know, you don't have to have an exposure. You can send like two bars to one detector and three bars on the H&O channel if you wanted for uh, training purposes as well. So that device is called the SIM Toolkit. We are doing some additional work. So this is some more R&D that we're doing. Where we're gonna add in multiple wireless options. Um, so right now we're just using a single ham radio frequency for that. Um, and then what we'll be able to do is eventually send the actual part per million information for the device into the thing. So that would be sending and updating it um, on uh, you know a, a, you know every couple second basis um, into the device. So the, the strong is the information is being stored and it's on the device. So that's the big takeaway. You can take it out, out of the device if you need to. I think it stores up somewhere like 480 hours worth of information and it starts to write over it. So there's a pretty lengthy um, data source that, that is present there. Okay, next question is, and you should see I changed the slide in the background intentionally. Do you have info on the S4PE, like the heating curve? I personally do not. I only know that it is a 10 second ramp from instrument being inserted and having the instrument pulled to 160, sec 160 degrees C. Uh, Scott, I don't know if you guys have info on the exact ramp speed. We, or yeah, we do. So it's a function of the voltage. So you are a battery and the voltage can vary in the battery a little bit. The second thing is just from a thermodynamic standpoint, your ambient environment that you're operating in and the temperature of the device by itself before you're using it. So for example, if it was you know in the kit and it's really cold outside and you pull it out and you use it, 
um, you know, that ramp's going to look a little bit different from the standpoint. So it's it's something, yes, we do know it under certain conditions, but because of the, you know, the couple of variables there, it's not something that is like repeatable every single time it follows this exact curve, if that makes sense. Okay, and we have one more from Henry. And how do you measure sensitivity as a function of vapor pressure? Okay, so that, oh, and then I just saw another one from Gerald. <laughs> Okay, uh, so let me go. So let me stick with that. What where we were for just a minute. Okay, we were just on and Henry. I'll go back to yours in a minute. But we we're just on the S four PE, and I don't know where Gerald comes from, but I hear there's a new heater available for higher temperatures. I did not put that out there. So anybody who's listening, I did not load that. <laughs> But thanks, Gerald, because I was asking that too. So yes, there is. Um, we are working with it. It should be available early next year. Um, so it's a higher temperature, allow us to go up to a uh, much higher temperature. So what Christina said is the original S4PE was designed for your chemical warfare agents. So there was a limit to how high the temperature that we wanted to get up to because you don't want to you know, you can actually harm the agent that you're trying to see um, or caramelize it is a kind of a way I like to describe it. You know, if you're if you're making caramel, there's a fine line between going too hot. Um, so you kind of just want it right. Um, but with some of the new materials that are out there, some of these, you know, your pure opioids, for example, your pharmaceutical based agents, as well as now your fourth generation agents like your Novichucks, they have a much higher temperature due to the vapor pressure differences. And so we are going to develop, it will be available um, early next year, a higher temperature variant of, of that. So um, yes, it's coming. It's going to be called S4PF. I was, I, I begged them for information about this and the, uh, the new AP4C Plus, if you haven't seen it, I got a chance to see uh, the new version of that and it was very cool. So I'm looking forward to getting a chance to play around with that some more once they uh, get some over here in the US for us to play with. But the last question I saw was from Henry and it was how do you measure sensitivity as a function of vapor pressure? So there's a lot that you have to do here. And I always talk about things saying, hey, the maximum headspace can be. Reality is we know the sensitivity of each channel in the AP4C, okay? And so by going through and figuring out from those channels, I know how low it can detect. For example, uh, for something that is phosphorus based, it's gonna get down to two parts per billion is the, the lowest it's gonna get. So we know that limit of detection. Now from that, I need to figure out what is the maximum amount of vapor something can produce. And so if I'm doing that in millimeters of mercury, there's a calculation that I can use that allows me to figure out what is the maximum headspace I can get if I'm doing everything correctly at room temperature. And reality is it's no different than taking, and I won't go through all the details behind it, but to get a quick estimate, take your, seven, your millimeters of mercury in the vapor pressure at room temperature. Multiply that by 1 million and divide that by 760. That will tell you an estimate, an estimate, quick estimate of the maximum amount of vapor pressure available. And so for something like TATP, TATP is an explosive material that you wouldn't expect to measure with a photonization detector. However, TATP is the only explosive that has a small amount of vapor pressure available to work with and with that vapor pressure you can figure out that a pid from and the, the pids i used in these examples just for reference was the pid 3000 um, parts per million from honeywell ray systems so when you look at those numbers that's where it came from but in this case tatp would produce 69 parts per million as the maximum vapor pressure or a maximum amount of headspace that you'd be able to measure. And so when I start looking at those numbers, I can figure out what's the max. And that tells me operationally a lot of information so I can start ruling out certain chemicals. So hopefully um, everybody enjoyed the questions and the times. I think we are now at 11.15, so we'll call it at that. We've answered the questions that had come in. 
If you have more questions, please feel free. I'll put them up one more time so that you can see uh, my email. Let me actually pull that down for a minute, take out the random at sign and put it back up for you. Okay, so if you look at that, you have myself and Scott, our emails and our phone numbers, and you can get a hold of us anytime. And if you have questions or want to delve deeper into a topic, please feel free to reach out. So yeah. thank you very much. Thank you to Pro Engine for sponsoring this and letting us play around with your instruments and coming up with different ways to use them. Yeah. Thanks for the questions. It was good. I always like good, challenging questions. So, especially ones that I did not drop in there. So I've got to take <laughs> your off. Oh, yeah, thank, you. yeah. thank you so much, man. That's great. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe out there and keep up the good fight.